Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 25th edition of Fantasia. Uh, my name is Celia Bouzé. I am one of Fantasia's curators, and I am also the, the director of the documentary from the Edge section. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us, and I hope you're enjoying the festival. Uh, there are still 10 days to go and many, many films, uh, so please check out our lineup. If you're looking for more documentaries, we have the hilarious Alien on Page, uh, the not so hilarious and actually quite creepy Lost Boys, and the documentary about punk rock star Holly Siren. Uh, all of those titles are available on demand, so you can watch them now or they're, they're going to be available uh, throughout the entire festival. But for now, uh, if you're with us uh, right now, it's because probably because you've seen uh, the war premiere of You Can Kill Me. Uh, and I'm here with uh, the team, but I'm also here with the team of the two shorts that are paired with me. Uh, so I'm going to introduce everyone. Uh, basically, we have, so from the You Can Kill Me team, we have director Haley Garrigas and producer Mike, Michael Butler. You guys can <laughs> see us here. Hello. Hi, Michael. Hi. Nice. Hi. And uh, for the truth about Hastings, we have director Dan, Dan Schneidkaut. Dan, have I pronounced it correctly? Perfect. You did a perfect job. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also with us, the team of Telosaur Bust, director Brad Abrams, and creator Kai Wada Rowe. Hello. Hello, guys. So um, if you are watching us on YouTube and you want to ask us a question, there's a Zoom link that you can click on, and you'll be able to just, like, drop a, a question in the chat. So maybe we can start with like everyone's background. If you want like to like go around and introduce yourself a little bit more, and most specifically, how you became involved in filmmaking. Who wants to start? <laughs> okay, I'll pick someone then. Uh, Kai. <laughs> Me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I grew up going to, I grew up in a small little town in Northern California where there was a few old movie theaters and they only showed old 60s and 70s movies, well, some 40s movies too. So I grew up as a kid going to see a lot of old movies and a lot of obscure art movies as well as at these theaters. And so I think that was my first love for movies. When I was probably 18, I got a Super 8 camera when Super 8 was still like cheap, you know, and I just went bananas with it. And I was always shooting and, you know, have projector parties in my friend's backyards. Um, and that was like, you know, 25, 27 years ago. Um, and then I filmed a little bit, I filmed a little bit more and I kept on filming and I probably have like a gazillion hours of footage still in the can that because I'm a horrible editor, because I'm a Pisces. Um, and so if, if it wasn't for meeting Brad and Matt, um, my little, little Timmy's dreams would have never have come true. <laughs> And so um, I'm happy that um, Telos or Bust um, is finally our, our, our mother, our, not our mothership, our flagship for our series, um, Keep mm -hmm. Focus Live. Right. So Brad, what about you? Um, so I was, I was sort of uh, like red-pilled early on by when I was just a, a kid by our like neighborhood video store clerk. And I would go in to rent probably really shitty action movies. And she would be like, no, no, you don't want that. You want this. And she would give me like David Lynch or Werner Herzog. And so just opening my eyes up at a very young age to like what good film was. Um, and that just that exposure made me want to, to tell stories like that. Um, but I ended up in the, in the documentary stream of things just found that that I like that more partly I'm I'm like more of an introvert and it's easier to just sort of like put my head down and and go forward with docs as opposed to narratives which are kind of like I, I've done them and they're kind of a nightmare for me all right what about 
Haley, do you want to? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, you know, started making short films in high school uh, and that went into college. And I had a short moment where I wanted to uh, become an architect and then that fell through. Uh, so I just decided to keep making, keep making little shorts and then I uh, work in the industry um, on, you know, the business side maybe the more evil side. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I do this to keep myself sane. Uh, and yeah, meme started about now four and a half conception, maybe five years ago uh, and plugged away. Michael, was that yeah. um I also grew up in Northern California, um, and I think the the film stuff started uh, when a close friend of mine got a little camcorder in fifth grade, and just that's all we did was make movies because um, it was just fun. So trying to just keep that up um, over the years, and um, I started working for a documentary producer out of college, and just that's how I ended up in the in the documentary world. So yeah, and it's, uh, I like it here. Okay. And then? Uh, well, I've been making films or movies uh, in one form or another for maybe 25 years. And uh, like Brad, I find it to be a total nightmare, uh, but I'm not particularly good at anything else. Uh, so this is what I continue to do. And uh, more recently, I I've started to make things out of uh, repurposed footage just because uh, there's been kind of a lack of resources. It's been a while since I've had like institutional support. So uh, I find myself making uh, documentaries and things like that where it's, it's easier to start uh, start making something from a, a material standpoint, like things that are available to me. I'd rather be making uh, probably narrative things or something like that. But I, I've done it all. I've, I've made four feature films, uh, two, two feature docs, and uh, uh, two, two feature kind of experimental narratives. So if you liked uh, that film, check those out sometime. Thanks. Yeah, where, where can we see them actually? Uh, they're all on the various uh, uh, streaming platforms, you know, like Amazon Prime and stuff like that. Uh, they have distribution through Brink Vision, which is a, a label out of North America and they should have international availability, but uh, like my most recent uh, feature documentary is called Boar King, so maybe start there. Uh, it's it's a lot of my things I make aren't exactly entertainment, and that's the closest thing I've ever made to entertainment. And it, uh, it heavily features Las Vegas, like uh, Haley's film. So uh, maybe start there. Okay, perfect. Uh, actually, I wanted to start it with your film uh, a little bit. Uh, it's definitely the most experimental uh, out of. Uh, all of them uh, uh, today. Uh, it's super hypnotic, super I mean, psychedelic. It feels to me almost as if I, you know, I have some kind of like VR, you know, thing and I'm entering some kind of simulation of what it's like to be in the mind of, you know, full-blown conspiracy theorists. But I ha I'm having those, you know, weird uh, visions. Uh, and it's it's really really cool. So how would you describe your film, and what was the the creative process like? Uh, well, that's interesting to hear. I'm glad it was like immersive in that way. Um, the creative process was I, I was I was dealing with a certain kind of anxiety that I feel when I, uh, I visit small towns. A sort of slow anxiety where I feel like the landscapes are sort of conspiring against me. I. Uh, I don't drive. I have a driver's license, but whenever ever I'm in a small town, I feel a little bit trapped. So this is kind of a way to explore how I feel trapped in a small town in a place where uh, you know no one can hear you scream. And then I also, uh, you know, simultaneously was thinking about the paranoia that people who live in rural areas have about city-dwelling people. Uh, at the time when I was editing it, uh, the city where I live, Minneapolis, was on fire. And uh, it was under martial law and tanks were driving down the streets. And uh, I'd been shot at several times by police. And 
uh, you know, uh, what would be called uh, right-wing dissidents in Haley's film. We're, we're driving through the streets and pointing guns at people and stuff like that. So, so I sort of incorporated this certain level of anxiety that was, that was happening there. And then, uh, you know, the, the visual element, the psychedelic element uh, started from uh, just, just watching YouTube, uh, YouTube videos about uh, the uh, reptilian conspiracies and oftentimes any like analog video glitch uh, would be considered evidence of shape-shifting amongst people like Hillary Clinton or whomever. So we decided to play with analog video glitching and take it to the, take it to the extreme in this film. So that's sort of where the psychedelic element came into the picture. Yeah, you, you, you talk about, um, there's a brief mention of Sibik, Sibok, uh, like an, uh, I believe it's an Egyptian god, right? Like a reptilian. Yeah. Is that, is that right? That's, that's correct. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, an Egyptian reptilian god. I don't, I don't know their, their relation to Keck at all, but, um, it, it, yeah, I was like, going to ask. There's a, there's a connection. Yeah, yeah it's re reptilians uh, versus uh, amphibians, I guess. But like, uh, I was reading David Icke, who's this English guy who's sort of the foremost authority on reptilian humanoids, and he talks about a lot of these Egyptian myths. But I didn't really do a lot of research. It wasn't like, a, you know, I'm not a journalist. It wasn't a, a journalistic endeavor so uh you know i just sort of picked this melange of uh reptilian related and conspiracy related things and threw them together in order to explore something about the pathos of you know north america in 2021 but i i didn't do much research so i can't tell you much about sobek uh wikipedia could tell you a lot more than i could yeah brad you're you're shaking your head and you're like <laughs> oh yeah because i i just I just did a, uh, my last doc was about this conspiracy theorist artist named David Dees. And so almost all of the themes in the, in your film um, are present in his life. So it just, it really felt like I was in his head while watching it or in the head of like you're saying these, these YouTube conspiracists that, that look for every single glitch as proof of, of the reptilian overlords. Um, and so I, I think it, I had like a similar reaction to Haley when watching it about being in the mind of more like the sort of almost the, the, the sort of paranoid vein of or paranoid delusional vein of, of conspiracy theorists, like the person that I had was just filming with. Well, it's an, it's an interesting headspace to explore. That's for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I had, I had fun kind of getting into that, you know, connecting numbers and, you know, uh -huh. a bunch of things that I think are otherwise absurd, but you can, if you start to entertain it in your mind, you can start to go down this, this rabbit hole that they create, which, which can be really fun until you get to the point of, you know, whatever Holocaust denial or these other really, yeah. things, you know, where, which is where it all ends up. For it does. Isn't yeah. that funny? As a, as a Jewish person, I find that very uh -huh. interesting that all of these conspiracy theories seem to end in one place. Yeah. And also the number stations I thought was interesting and was curious, like why, why you made that a part of the the doc i mean it makes it makes sense on some levels but curious why you. i mean i just think they're really interesting and they're in their eerie of course and they're and they're incorporated in a lot of different people's conspiracy theories so i thought mm -hmm. they, they just they they uh they added to the atmosphere that was about it i didn't think too hard about the uh -huh. i knew they were i knew they were kind of like a public domain and uh yeah thing to put in the background just to you know uh scramble people's minds a little more so you, you have a, like a super, super unique style. And I was wondering what, uh, if, if you had any specific inspirations uh, in terms of like filmmakers, if there were, you know, specific references for you. Uh, well, for this film in particular, there's a filmmaker named Kelly Sears. Uh, she's, a, she's a film professor at the University of Colorado. I don't know if you're familiar, but everyone should write down Kelly Sears. Like I didn't steal her her style, but there was a tonal thing about her films that I really appreciate. You know, she, uh, she creates a certain type of anxiety that is uh, amazing. And she also does something that I, that I think is, is super interesting, which she takes like repurposed imagery 
that isn't in and of itself very interesting. And then she gives it, she gives it weight and she gives it uh, subtext in a really, really thoughtful way uh, that I was, you know, I kind of dedicated this film to her because it, it was the, the tone, if anything, was inspired by her work. But what she does is more like experimental animation. But uh, yeah, you should check out some of her films. Like uh, there's one called Applied Pressure. That's the most recent one that I saw. But uh, she, she's done many films and some of them are available on, uh, on like uh, Vimeo. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, there's one called The Drift, too, that would be a good start because it's also like science fiction. Uh, so uh, you should, everyone here, everyone listening, uh, check out Kelly Sears. Uh, she's brilliant. Okay, cool, exciting. Um, let's uh, let's switch to to tell us our best uh, a little bit. Uh, um, so tell us our best. You you briefly mentioned so it's a pilot for a TV series, mm -hmm. which I'm super beyond excited. I don't know if you uh, you haven't released a little teaser because I've seen a little. Oh, something, <laughs> but it's not it's not out yet. But um, maybe um, Kai, maybe you can start with, uh, you know, you you're the creator of the project, so you can start a little bit with the genesis of the project and then how you met Brad. Sorry. Um, so the purpose of Chelis or Bust, obviously. If for me, folklore is extremely important because it gets lost uh, throughout time. And the folklore that I find the most fascinating is the smaller folklore that, that could not maybe go outside a hundred mile radius from a small little town or a village. And so um, I realized um, years ago, I was in the Himalayas collecting folklore on the Yeti and all of the newer generation was moving to the city or outside of Nepal. And the, the good, the folklore stories were dying with the old people. And so I thought, you know, it, it just needs to get preserved. And so the, the whole purpose of Keep Folklore Alive, which is the series, it's not to explain the story. It's not to show you everything. There's no like, um, you know, ABC, here's, the, here's everything. It's, it's, we open a door, we show you a world you never knew existed that's right next to you. Then we close the door. We show you a glimpse of something you never knew about. And it's an encouragement for the viewer to explore this world they just glimpsed on their own because it's still there. And so our Tell Us or Bust is about, you know, the underground city of Mount Shasta. Well, if you drive past Mount Shasta, you're driving on the five, you're coming from somewhere in California and you're driving up to probably Portland, Oregon. And it's got maybe two, maybe three exits and that's it. This Mount Shasta and, and it, you're, you're gone. And so playing music, you know, on tour, you just drive past Mount Shasta. Maybe you pull over to get gas, but usually you don't. And finally we pulled over and it's just like this world, this of people you meet that are so eccentric and yet they're totally different, you know? And, and so once you go in there and you realize that there's multiple worlds in people's minds, what's underneath this mountain, what's above this mountain. I mean, we didn't even talk about some of the things like uh, the native Americans and their, their feel on Bigfoot and the little, and the little elves that they have, you know, on the mountain. And so there's just all these things that, you know, whether they were created long ago or created now, they're, they're created. And so we're just trying to help preserve that. So um, this one is our first one. Our, set, our next one is um, Support Your Local Monster, which is all about monsters that probably no one's ever heard about. Nice. And so how did you uh, meet Brad? How did you guys start collaborating? Oh, um, I... In San Francisco, I hosted uh, two Bigfoot Bonanza. They were a film festival and conferences. And uh, Brad and Matt submitted, I, I had not met them, and they submitted their short, which was Swan Song of the Skunk Ape. Um, and it was, it's a what, 11 minute long short about mm -hmm. the, the skunk ape in Florida. And it was so amazing. I showed it, I showed it like multiple times a day, all three days of the event. Um, 
And the next the next film festival I did was a Space Visitors Film Festival. And I had like a space cult come up and um, and they submitted uh, Love and Saucers. And they came out for that one. And I just hit it off with these guys. And I love I love uh, everything that they do. And, and they're low pace, um, you know, uh, the cinematography and, and just the angle at it. You know, we're, we're not making fun of anybody. We're letting them just talk. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of what Earl, like early Earl Morris, you know, where you just let people talk. Like in, like in Vernon, Florida, where the, where the fellas talking about the diamond. You guys remember that scene where he's under the tree and he's, he's look, talking about looking in the diamond and he's got the little thing for looking at the flaws in the diamond. And he's just like, I have no idea what they're even looking for, but it's just the looking part. And so, yeah, so that, I think this is a big, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. So that, that's the style. And I guess that style, same, similar with um, early less blank films too. It's just, it's just good people, you know, or not, not even good people, just people. Capturing people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say, uh, and uh, and Brad, you can you can talk about that a little bit. Like, uh, I remember watching Love and Sorcerers, and the way that you approach your your subject, and even with the the David Bee's uh, short that you made, uh, you know, there there is no judgment. You're just uh, you, and you get very very close to those. Uh, those people and um, I don't know what's what's the process for you how do you approach them how do you approach your, your, your subject yeah I think they they probably see like a little bit of, of crazy that's in me and Kai when we meet them and they're like oh these are people I can actually open up to um, but but for the most part the what what makes it even if I don't I don't um, agree with any of the beliefs or don't believe them myself. Um, the people that I pick, usually I want to make sure that they're, they're like good people to, you know, in some realm. Um, and then I can use that as a way to create the sort of empathic bridge to the audience. Um, and usually it's an audience that's much more skeptical than even me. Um, and especially with, with Mount Shasta, they're all like really sweet people no matter how sort of out there some of their beliefs are. Um, and some of them do get into the realm, like, you know, all of these ascended beings that they, that they idolize, they're all like white and blonde and they never think about that critically, that, that that's the perfect being. Um, but for the most part, and, and when confronted with that, they're like, oh no, it has nothing to do with race. It's just, that's just what they look like. Um, but otherwise, yeah, they're, they were all just super sweet and they're all searching for something, which is, I think everyone can relate to. Um, and, you know, there, a lot of them are older and they're getting like sick. Um, a lot of their friends are dying in this belief that, oh, I, you know, maybe I can get to this city that's under the mountain and I can live forever and I can be healthy and I can be with all of these exalted beings. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the animator? That you mm -hmm. found, I, I love the, the the visual style. It's just great. Yeah, he was um, and this guy I met as an intern at this like production company I was working for. I helped hire him as an intern and watch him become this like incredible illustrator, animator, artist. Uh, just like blows my mind what he does. And he just like immediate as soon as we showed him the rough, he was he just like immediately knew what to do without even much communication at all on our part. Nice. Yeah, Joe Garber is his name, if anyone wants to check out his work. Yeah, I was going to ask like if he has like a, an Insta. That can... Yeah, just look up Joe Garber, incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I'm gonna get into meme now. Uh, <laughs> but of course you guys are more than welcome to jump in and I, I'm going to have more general questions uh but i mean to start very basic Haley, uh if you can tell us uh when did you shot all of that and when, when did it started and uh and how long did it take you, you mentioned it briefly but <laughs> uh yeah so 
uh, a lot of that footage was between 2017 and 2018 and then some 2019 um, and started thinking about the idea uh, and researching in 2016. Okay. So yeah, and editing, you know, end of 2019, 2020. <laughs> Michael, who is producer, but also is the editor as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I think Michael came on board, what, early 2019, mid 2019? Like mid 2019, yeah. Mid 2019, yeah. And at that point, I'd been editing for about eight months um, and totally thought it was done, <laughs> uh, as, as I think we all do. I think I had a three hour cut once that I was like, this is it. This is, this is the, and, uh, and I think Michael can attest also, it started a lot more, um, I, I think it started a lot more experimental. And then we really like tried to shape a story uh, into it which Michael helped tremendously. Yeah, I think originally we thought we'd be, when I came, came on board, I think you had a rough cut and we were like, oh, this, you know, probably have like two months left of finishing this film. It's like a year and a half later. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so you, you, you describe it as a, an anti-documentary. So I think it's really like bold. Like, I, I'd like to know why exactly why, what the... <laughs> Um, so I think that that was, you know, conceived of uh, also maybe around the time that Michael came on board and we were just thinking about this, this story, this like my uh, journey as like the narrator um, being, you know, kind of like a parallel to myself, you know, not necessarily me, Haley, but a, a different Haley. Um, kind of the, to mimic the parallel world, worlds that I was um, exploring. And so we were like, okay, anti-documentary, like this isn't necessarily, um, you know, purporting uh, any kind of like truth or uncovering anything. Uh, and that's never been, that's never, that was never what I sought out to do. Uh, again, like echoing Dan, I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's entertainment, but also trying to find some some kernel uh, or just like an entry point into a world that, you know, I didn't really know about. And so at, at what point did you think that this is a documentary? You start you start researching, but at what point is the is there is there a shift, and you're like this is this is a movie? Um, yeah, no, I think I think it started. So how did I wanted to make a documentary about the nuclear waste plant in Vegas, um, okay. and that's why I went to Vegas. And so the first three months I had. Uh, not the plant, a nuclear waste facility, you know, that mountain where all the nuclear waste in the country goes. Um, and so that's why I moved to Vegas and I was talking to Kirk also simultaneously. I thought there were maybe going to be two separate ideas. And then in Vegas, just the Kirk, uh, you know, the Kirk conversations really started ramping up and this new other story started, started emerging um, and I just basically canned four months of material on the nuclear waste facility and just ran with it. Okay. And um, so obviously uh, everything that you're talking about, this used to be very underground and very, very niche. And it's, um, it's now a f mainstream discussion. So I was wondering how your perspective has changed if if it has changed, uh, you know, with that with that shift. Uh, yeah, so I think it's definitely. I guess the way that it shifted for me is, you know, coming on to you know four and a half five years of thinking about this stuff. Uh, I, you know, I'm starting to think about other things, um, and because I was just so. Uh, Kind of embedded in that world, I almost have like, <laughs> uh, 
a, some like fatigue from it, you know, like it, it, it's sort of as things come out or as, as people start, you know, talking about it. Um, I, it's like the, the, the desire to want to talk about it more is, 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 uh, not as bright for me. Um, and I mean, I think anyone who's, you know, and anybody here making movies, you know, I think at a certain point you want to start thinking about the next subject, um, and like, keep it, keep this one project encapsulated. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I think that that's really how it shifted. Um, and I still love thinking about all of these, these people that I met and all of these, you know, what happened and the magic. Um, but I think with a lot of things, once, you know, a majority of people start talking about it, everything gets a little like obscured. You know, it's, it's a lot harder to really like put your finger on it when mm -hmm. there's just so many voices um, that have a lot of different opinions on them, you know, cause like when you're really getting into a subject and researching it at first, um, and it's like a new world for you and like echoing Brad, like when I first watched Mulholland Drive, it was like a whole new world, uh, opened and like that excitement when you're 15 watching that or watching anything that you first come across is like, is, is the beauty in, in starting a new project. And then uh, you know, when it becomes like newsworthy, uh, it, when people are writing like op eds or chiming in and, you know, there are all these forums and people talking about it, it, it can be a little disorienting, you know, and it's an already disorienting topic. So, yeah. uh, that's, that's really where I'm at with it now. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, I mean, for myself, even like, even preparing for just preparing for this Q and A, like, I, and I have a very like spider web kind of mind. I'm getting interested in something, then it takes me to something, etc. You know, and so I know that I fall into rabbit holes very quickly. <laughs> and so I was wondering how you 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 maintain your 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 focus uh, and you didn't drown in in those, you know, um, this ocean of of information. Yeah. Um... Well, I definitely did drown uh, for a while. I, <laughs> it's it's hard not to it's hard not to drown, uh, and I think that the the saving grace was you know having bringing a team on you know bringing people other voices other eyes because like I said when I first met Michael and then Sam Gursky and Carrie Mack who were my other EPs on it um, I you know, like I said, I had a three hour cut and I was like, this is it, you know, like, and I was really in the rabbit hole, you know, I was like very much, very much submerged. And so having people kind of be your, your reality anchors is yeah. really helpful. You know, like I think when you, if you're working in a vacuum all alone, that's for me at the beginning of a project, it's important, but then I need to kind of come up for air at a certain point. Yeah, absolutely. So Michael, how do, how do you feel about that, that you were this kind of anchor? He knows. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's always obviously helpful to have other perspectives come in on any kind of project. Um, but I think what was exciting for me is probably what was exciting for Haley when she started shooting and researching was just like curiosity, which is like usually where a documentary gets started is just like, I don't know about this um, and I want to know more. Um, and I think... Haley was at the kind of end of that road by the time I came in because it was, you know, longer cut and there was a lot of different ideas. Um, and it helped for me to kind of in making sense of like, like part of cu cutting it and trying to pull out the characters in the narrative was also kind of learning about the stuff as well. And so I think that made it a lot easier uh, in terms of, you know, structuring it and uh, yeah, editing it finally, um, yeah. You're talking about a three hour long uh, cut. I'm now wondering what, what was left out, uh, what, <laughs> what didn't make the final cut. If you have maybe one, one thing that uh, you're, you're still thinking about and, uh, or a couple. Yeah. That was I, a while I, ago. Yeah, <laughs> well, to think back to the three hour cut, I think there were a lot more like ambient scenes uh, there's a lot more, um, just like, 
you know, I really, really just refuse to learn how to work a tripod correctly. So there's just, and you know, shakiness and, and that's all great. I, I do, I, I don't think that an image needs to be still. Um, and, you know, I think some of the characters that were like left over from the nuclear waste uh, interviews, I tried to bring them in somehow mm -hmm. into, into this, but it just, it didn't work. It was just too, it was too messy. Um, that's its own. I think there are several people who've been trying to make a doc on the nuclear waste, that nuclear waste uh, facility. Uh, so yeah, those characters were in the three hour cut and uh, they, probably, I think also a lot, a lot more narration as well um, that we cut down. Yeah, um, a lot. Oh yeah. A lot of narration, a lot more thoughts that I had that <laughs> didn't need to be in the, in the film. But we're, but we're like important to getting there. I think that's the other yeah, thing yeah, too. Exactly. It's like you do all that like work and you see it laid out um, and it, yeah, informs your next, your next kind of move. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I was wondering actually a bit the, the same thing for uh, Brad and Kai, if there were, uh, you know, a character or two that were left out or didn't make the final cut. No, so we, you know, for us, it was just like, the economy of scale where we we only had a few days and didn't have any money so pretty much everything you see is in there there were a few people that that um that didn't want to be in the film one of them because they mm. they looked at kai's facebook and saw like too many demonic images and they were more interested in angelic type energies they were afraid of kai and said they didn't want to be in the film <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what do you have to say for yourself? I don't know. I, I like I listen to like sixties flute jazz and you know <laughs> I don't I don't even know what like you know, like um yeah, I don't know. It was pretty funny. That one that was that was a bad one too, because we should have oh the Bigfoot's appearing behind me again. Yeah. Um because um she would have been great. Uh yeah, darn it. I think she was um, from yeah, Scandinavia. And she had this great accent and she had like this super blonde, poofy hair. And she was really into talking to the, you know, the outer beings. She was really, you know, a uh, pre-space seed kind of person, you know. Now, like everyone who's like 30 and under is like, I'm a space seed from the planet, blah, blah. She, she was like way above that. Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting to go back because as sort of how like this whole QAnon and like anti vax culture has has eaten the new age world. How if it's manifested there too, and if they've now like gone rightward, like a lot of of new age culture has. Yeah, um, absolutely. I was I, I was going to to, to follow on uh, on that. Um, I I have recently caught a strong interest in the love as one cult. Or Mother God, I don't know if you heard about it. Mm -hmm. It was my, <laughs> my uh, your my obsession. Sub yeah, my absolute <laughs> obsession. Thank you for calling me out on that. I was really obsessed. But uh, I was introduced um, through that uh, uh, about like the the light workers and 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 Carol in uh, in Mim really really caught my attention. So I wanted to to uh, talk a little bit more about Carol with you. Carol, uh, yeah, Carol, Carol. Um, so Carol, yeah, I met Carol um, uh, on the internet. Uh, I went to her house to go meditate. Um, it was not about the movie. I just was alone in Vegas and wanted to make some friends. Uh, and Carol, it was Carol's house. She was hosting the meditation meetup. And when I got there, I just, I kind of like, you know, boing, it, it just clicked um, that she needed to be involved. Uh, and she was very warm and welcoming and let me into her home many times, into her life. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm forever, forever grateful to her. Yeah, she, she's she's really really touching. Um, um, and it, and it's funny because like um, I don't remember his name. I think it's Nick, 
who this magician um, that that we see with with Carol and and he for, for me personally it's it, he rubbed me the wrong way at first mm-hmm. but but through the, the way that you filmed him like you, you still had a way to it was very non-judgmental and I really admire that uh, so I was wondering how you you, you approached him uh yeah so he yeah it, it's a, it's interesting how they all came together but he, uh him and mason at the time were living at carol's house working with another person who was also living at carol's house um on this grand theory that they you know that they had uh and when i was filming them yeah i guess the non judgmental aspect of it is I, I think because I'm going into it, not really judging them and kind of being open to their lives and their experiences and their, what they believe. Um, I, it just come, I think it just, the interviews then come off that way. Uh, and I think I made a, a big point, at least in the edit and like talking with Michael about this, that at no point did I want to roast anyone or intentionally edit them a certain way. Um, that's very, super important to me, uh, going, you know, going forward and even, you know, because these people like open themselves up to you, you know, um, and it's very vulnerable. And obviously once you sign a release, technically you can do whatever you want (laughs) to an extent, but is, I just, you know, it, it didn't really feel like it would, it would be true to, um, like the pathos of the movie, um, and how I was like approaching them. Yeah. It seemed Haley like that, that all of your subjects really liked you in the That's film and especially I ones know. that, yeah, that, um, yeah. that likely just with another person wouldn't have even agreed to be on camera. And I was mm-hmm. wondering if you had to sort of like, if you had this internal barrier so that they didn't like you too much or think that you were necessarily like you're on my side now and you're gonna get my word out. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question, Brad. I, uh, you know, I think because I just was open to talking to that. I think it's like that might, it is the maybe more like mind blowing thing. Um, and, you know, some even like express this to me, like especially Kirk is that people just don't listen to, to him. You know, I think it's just so easy to like shut off, obviously, um, especially when people are saying certain things that you may not agree with. Uh, and, you know, and I think I was just also curious about the the subjects they were talking about, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I came in with an, it, like an interest in magic, you know, and like what that is and how people believe in it and how they practice it. And then, you know, also with all of the, you know, uh, more online nefarious political things that they were talking about. Just, it was just interesting. Haley, I have a question. I have a question about that. Uh, Did you find yourself kind of even subconsciously like practicing magic while you were doing this? Like, did it get into your brain so much that you were using it? I'm, I'm thinking in particular about the part where the guy didn't want you to film him at the party. And all you had to say was, Oh, uh, nobody will see this for a year. And then he was all on board. And I, that felt magical to me. That felt like some kind of magical uh, manipulation of this guy that I, I couldn't possibly explain. So I, I'm wondering if even subconsciously, if you don't believe any of these things, if you're not, if you're not uh, mystical like that, if you found yourself like a, attempting it in your life. Uh, you know, um... It's like what is what is it the the like the root of um esoteric is like to to be hidden you know it's like the things that are hidden um so yeah perhaps there I, there's like there was one moment in the edit where i i thought about creating uh like a splice sigil throughout the film <laughs> uh, that would like come together at the end didn't I uh, technical prowess didn't didn't work but you know it's like a it, I had I had that I had that thought definitely um but yeah and also maybe it, it was just 
again, going back to just being open to them. And also, and I think in that, you know, you can be really, I think it could be manipulative, you know, if you like are going in it with the intention of maybe portraying them in a different way than what you promised or what you talked about. And so I am happy with the result because, you know, uh, people have seen it and are okay with it and are happy, you know, and, you know, most importantly, Kirk. Um, and uh, that was a big litmus test for me, you know, cause the last thing I want is, you know, someone to be angry with how they were represented, which happened all the time, all the time. Yeah, I was so. going to to ask if some of them had already seen the, the film and how are you preparing yourself with the, the, the feedback that you're, you may get? Yeah, no. Uh, so I've had one, one person in the film who hasn't seen the film, um, but is actually probably sounds like the most grounded out of anyone or just has the most like just very like a really comes in with a explaining things and making things digestible um and i got an email that like they didn't know that the, that they they don't remember filming a documentary or being a part of a documentary filmed with them twice um i've got emails i've got releases we did but you know and and T took it took from the description of the film on the Fantasia website because that's how they they you know found out that it was premiering because he hadn't been they hadn't been like responding to anything for a while um, and thought that it was a fascist propaganda film um, and so you know I it's like how do you really respond to they hadn't seen it yet you know and so I. Uh, uh yeah so i don't know i don't really know how how one would deal with that other than just you know sending them the link and showing them that it's not i mean and if it is to them it is to them that's just kind of the nature of things you're gonna watch you're gonna find what you want to find when you're watching the film yeah absolutely i mean i think brad has some some kind of idea himself because you've had some some experiences uh, with uh, the WD. Oh yeah, my my last doc, um, which is about the one I mentioned about the conspiracy theorist, um, it got put onto BitChute, which is like it's the free speech YouTube, but it mostly just means like it racist trolls, um, and almost all the comments were about like just anti-Semitic directed towards me as the director, because I mentioned I'm Jewish in the piece and in reference to his, his fairly anti-Semitic art. Um, and it was like just a daily, like luckily it wasn't, it wasn't really, I wasn't getting like emailed or called or anything or docs, but it was sort of the first time being kind of directly attacked like that online, uncomfortable, yeah. But I was expecting it, so it's not a surprise. So um, a bit of a more general um, question, I guess. Um, now that we are, I mean, actually talking about beat shoots specifically, uh, one thing that shocked me recently was like actually digging into beat shoots and even just YouTube and seeing, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try it manip manipulative expose that are called documentary, you know, and that, that take the, the title of documentary and that are just uh, really uh, just disinformation and, and very dangerous. Um, I was wondering if you had any, I guess, advice for, for a spectator to, to, to build a strong critical analysis you know, and to, to, to protect themselves when, when they are dealt with, uh, with, with this information like that? Maybe it's a, it's a I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear an answer. 
it's a tough one. I mean that. I mean that's what YouTube is trying to do when they they flag everything and say, you know, with the COVID nineteen flag or QAnon flag, but that doesn't seem helpful at all. In fact, it yeah. seems to just drive people further away. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what would would our own best protection would be against that? Like, you know, if I'm if I'm I don't know what I'm watching, you know, what maybe what are the signs that I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> I think if it seems like, you know, if it seems like it's a promotional video for ideas or people, like if it has a, a very strong opinion, because mm -hmm. that's not really what documentaries do. Like that's what that's what infomercials and propaganda videos are. Yeah. So that I think is the best like indicator like if something is. <laughs> An agenda, you know, I feel like yeah. we're good at, 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 we've got a good sense of when something has an agenda. And I think yeah. our, in our world, we try to do our best to, to not have an agenda. Um, yeah. And I think we get, have a good sense of when something's kind of working that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anyone see the pandemic documentary? No? I didn't make it all the way through, but I watched yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, that's like kind of perfect example. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that language of persuasion that people use. I was definitely playing with that in my film, the idea that if you come uh, from this place of authority and air of authority and you have the right voice talent or something, this is, a video can be very persuasive, even if it's total nonsense. And I don't have an answer to your question other than people ought to just throw their computers out or something. But <laughs> I, I am interested in the idea of the medium of persuasion and stuff like that and what, what makes one thing persuasive when it's total nonsense and something that's, you know, maybe completely factual, isn't persuasive at all. Uh, and magic. I, I, yeah, exactly. It must be. I mean, I guess, do you, do you guys feel a lot more responsibility as documentarians to, to have an, an even stronger ethic in this era of dis disinformation? Well, I don't consider myself a documentarian, so I can't really answer that. Uh, well, or as filmmakers. <laughs> Ethics. Um. I think that kind of like, it's a kind of higher order thinking that makes, that would make making a film really difficult because you're, so much of your time is spent attending to like details and like story and character and what have you. And that you kind of have to just trust that you're what, like a, a good person or your intentions are good, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think, I think when you start thinking in that higher order way, that's when it actually weirdly ends up kind of having something that ends up having an agenda or ends up, you know, it, it starts to slip into your personal views or political views. And it's like, you know, filmmaking, I think whether it's narrative or documentary is like a way to kind of like get yourself outside of your own thoughts, you know, and your own views that you hold and kind of, connect with other people's. So I think, uh, I mean, I have one last question and let me know if you have any other remarks or anything, but I guess one of the, the things, uh, that one of my thoughts that, that keeps coming back when I'm watching your films are, you know, really like, if this is where we are now in terms of like, uh, you know, chaos and, in, in beliefs and, you know, a new myth uh, and how rapidly it's changing and it's spreading, you know, what, what vision do you have for the near future? How, how is this going to evolve? Well, I don't, I don't think this is unprecedented. Uh, I think mm -hmm. during times of social upheaval, there's always uh, people gravitate towards uh, dogma and mysticism and things like that. You know, in, in Haley's documentary, the, the anonymous gentleman from the UK speaks about the Weimar Republic. And there's a lot of really interesting things about that period in German history where everyone sort of uh, got, got really, really invested in the, the occult and mysticism and all the things that these films are talking about. Um, so, so it's not necessarily unheard of that people will gravitate towards new dogmas and things like this during during these periods. But what I think makes this interesting and all these films very interesting is, is that they're interrogating how uh, technology affects this, this very basic human, human need to make sense of the world. Yeah, it seems like in, in my experience, 
with these types of subjects, the difference is uh, people are are more and more um, not interacting with with other humans in real life, um, and that that's that's the most important thing. I feel like um, like with with I think like a lot of people in Haley's film, they're only interacting online and um, their sphere becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and that I think the smaller it gets, the more dangerous it gets. And all it takes is like, it can just be like a human interaction uh, that, that widens that bubble a little bit. Um, and that's the difference I think from whatever 30 years ago to now is, is that, that, um, shrinking exposure to a human being. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, again, echoing, I don't, I don't think this is, I think like this, the speed at which everything is being, you know, disseminated is unprecedented, but, you know, these, the way, the tendencies that people have aren't, mm -hmm. um, and in terms of you know staying grounded or going back to the other question and how you decipher, I mean, you know, I think that that starts. And again, what Michael said, I, I agree with. I don't necessarily think it's on the filmmaker uh, because you kind of get into some really tricky territory when you're just trying to to please or just you know be be the you know, be the, the ethics police um, going in with a good intention. Um, and then also for the viewer, um, like when you're trying to under, like make sense of things and have any kind of sense-making ticker, um, I think what's first important is look, you know, creating a community like in the, in the flesh and blood. Um, and then that helps a lot, you know, because if you're just wrapped up and even, you know, even if you have, you know, you're not one of these people, right? If you're not like a conspiracy theorist, but the majority of your interaction is just on, you know, text or Instagram or social media, um, if th things can get a little, you don't know, you don't have like that reality anchor that I was talking about earlier as much. Like if you're, you know, you know your neighbors, you know, you know who lives right next door to you or, you know, you have a bodega or like a supermarket you go to that you just talk to the people you know and I think that that is really important because then you take that sort of sense of community elsewhere um that's my two cents but who knows I don't know yeah I think D Dan mentioned technology I think that's the other kind of part of this which is you know the printing press had a similar effect and tv had a similar effect and now you know social media and, and the internet is having you know we're we're still in the process of figuring out what exactly it does. I think that's like a large part of maybe what we're trying to do is just figure out kind of what's going on first and foremost, you know, uh, cause it feels, I, I feel in that way connected to a lot of the characters in, in me because it's kind of, you know, you kind of feel dizzied by the world and it's like, it takes a lot of work to try to make sense of it. Um, but yeah, I think we're definitely still in the process of figuring out kind of what's going on day by day, it changes. Absolutely. Well, I guess I'm going to close on that. And I will just have one small last question if, is if you have a next project uh, in line and also where can people find you on social if they want to get updates on, on, on what you're making? Um, yeah, so uh, meme is gonna be released um, with Utopia in December, early December. So you can catch it online somewhere at that point. Um, uh, there is a, a new Instagram <laughs> for meme as uh, new territory. Uh, so to follow updates on that, it's you can't kill meme on Instagram. Uh, and then next project, uh, you know, right now also very similar to Dan, I've just over the past year been doing a lot of shorts uh, with material that I already have or things that I can just do 
uh, and my surroundings. Um, so that's been a really, that's been a blessing. Um, and then I'm working slowly on my next feature doc. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I can go ahead. So I'm, I'm working on a, or co-directing a, a feature documentary about conspiracy theorists, like profiles on specific conspiracy theorists. Uh, and then a, a besides this folklore doc series, uh, a doc series about cryptozoologists. So the people that study the animals that don't exist, or some of them might. Um, and then Kai and I were gonna do this really short little thing later in the year about this guy called Rocky Angel. And he's, he's like this, this Oakland based outsider artist nudist um, who wears, he sort of was always wearing different wrestler face paint um, and just a, a kind of mind blowing guy. A cosmic, he's a cosmic artist. Yeah, a cosmic artist. Yeah. That's gonna be so much fun. I think <laughs> I, I think I think we're in it because it's fun, right? Yeah. We, we all do this because it's fun. <laughs> How about you, Dan? What's next for you? Uh I'm always I'm always working on four or five things that I'm not sure if I'll ever finish. So I won't talk <laughs> about that. But uh, I, I have I'm sitting on two uh, feature narrative film. So if any financiers are watching, please get in touch. As long as you're not a some greasy scumbag or whatever, I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, I'm only saying that because I had pitch meetings with a greasy scumbag like two weeks ago. Anyway, um, and I passed. But uh, and then so if you want to uh, if you want to see some of my work, I have kind of a crappy website. It's DanSProductions.com. And then I have like an Instagram, which is uh, Sepulchral Voice, or you can just look up my name on Instagram and you should be able to find it there. And, uh, pretty, pretty easy to find me. And then, like I said, I have features that are also pretty easy to find. Uh, you guys should check them out, try to watch them. Uh, start with working, I guess. And then, uh, yeah, work your way through the stuff if you like that. I, I think that's all I got. This is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Dan. Who else? Michael? Kai? Um, yeah, uh, you can't kill meme Instagram for news and updates uh, on where it'll play. Uh, and then I uh, uh, producing a film that is just about to start editing um, follow, uh, about a institute for the blind in Miami. So different kind of oh, stuff. Cool. Very different. Um, and that has just been following um, young people different ages uh, experiencing different levels of uh, visual impairment just how they're you know going through the world so hopefully that'll be out and done by early next year so yeah um like dan i have like uh, as many projects as an octopus has hand so uh i am very content on just waiting when brad has a hot moment for us to go and film rocky and to continue the next I think we have what seven episodes of Keep Folklore Alive, like down the line. So whenever uh, the moolah starts coming in, or I start, you know, digging some uh, some good gold in the river, then we can finish these up. Fly to Iceland, fly to Japan. I got to work on my dousing, I guess, a little better for a nice rich vein of of this stuff. Um, oh, but I guess what our Instagram lazily is uh, keep folklore alive. Pretty lazy. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for for being with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your films. Um, and uh, and a word to the audience who are watching us. Uh, if you um, if you love. You can kill me. You can recommend it, and there is going to be a repeat screening in two days. Uh, so it's going to be available in the VOD style, but only for 24 hours. So, uh, so go ahead and, and recommend the film, and it will be available along with uh, Telos Arbus and the truth about castings. So, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Hopefully, meet you thank soon you. around the festival circuit. I hope. Yes. And, yep. uh, <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Celia. This is yeah. great. Yeah, thanks so much.
much. This is awesome. Next time, cocktails. Cocktails next time. Yes, cocktails next time. Mocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.